Our next presenter is the Associate Professor of Marketing at Wharton. And I never understand this, because so, you know, Jonah, I unfortunately am, did not get to go to school when you were teaching. And it like, always kills me that how schools are still so rigid, right? He's Associate Professor of Marketing, but he's like a New York Times best-selling offer. You'd think they might at least say, OK, come on, we got to get you like a better title. Like, it just, I don't know, there's a disconnect here that bothers me uh, with that. However, the uh, only disconnect, I think, is going to be like how we at, at our shows didn't actually weren't smart enough to have Jonah first. So this is going to be great. Author of Contagious, Jonah Berger, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, everyone here today has a very similar goal, uh, and that is how can we help uh, our brands uh, and our companies and organizations catch on? How can we help our organizations be even more successful uh, than they have been already? And I'm going to talk uh, this morning about the power of word of mouth to do exactly that. How we can use word of mouth to bring in new customers, uh, new collaborators, and new folks to work with our organization. And I think when we think about word of mouth, there's only one challenge. We all know that we want it. The question is, how do we get it? How do we get people to talk about and share our stuff? And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but I know it's a little early. Uh, I know the coffee is still coursing through some of your veins. Uh, so to help us wake up a, a little bit, uh, I'm going to play a quick game. Uh, and I promise this is a game you have not played before, but you will get the hang of it uh, very quickly. It's called Which is Tastier? Uh, I'm going to put two things on the screen, and I'm going to ask you which of those two things is tastier. And you only have one job, to be honest. Not which thing you wish was tastier, not which thing you think should be tastier, uh, but which of the two things on the screen is actually tastier. I promise you will get the hang of this uh, quite quickly. Uh, our first contestant is a wonderful and delicious head of broccoli. Now, you're probably aware that broccoli has a lot of vitamins and nutrients. Uh, you're probably aware that broccoli has a lot uh, of fiber. You may not have realized that broccoli has a lot uh, of vitamin C, but it does. Uh, so our first contestant uh, is wonderful and delicious broccoli. And our second contestant, is a cheeseburger. Now, this is not my version of a cheeseburger. Uh, if I would eat a cheeseburger, it would certainly have bacon on top. Some very unscientific research done mainly by myself shows that everything is better with bacon on top. Uh, I might put some grilled onions. Uh, I might put some blue cheese. Feel free to put whatever topping you like on the cheeseburger. And to keep things even, to be fair, feel free to put whatever toppings you like on the broccoli uh, as well. Uh, just to be fair, right, to keep things even. So now we have to vote. This is the tough part. Uh, which do we think is tastier? How many of you would go with the cheeseburger? OK, looks like almost everybody. Uh, anybody for the broccoli? OK, a few here and there. Uh, are you guys vegetarians? No? Uh, liars? Uh, no, maybe, maybe you're a pescatarian, maybe you're a vegan. The uh, point here is really simple. We all know that we should eat more broccoli. Right? The government organizations spent decades of time and billions of dollars trying to convince people to eat more fruits and vegetables. And yet when push comes to shove, people don't do it. Right? When it's late at night, when we're on the road, when we're tired, the cheeseburger beckons. And it's not random or luck how it works. Right? It fits better with the way our tongues and our stomachs are, are designed. Certain food, very simply, uh, is just tastier than others. Um, and so we know that. That's true. Uh, McDonald's spent millions of dollars engineering French fries. It's the right amount of crisp and salt and sugar. They hit your tongue. Your tongue lights up. Right? Certain food is just tastier than others. And you just had breakfast, and you probably had a very nice, uh, enjoyable breakfast. You're probably wondering what food has to do with what we're going to talk about today. Well, I'd like to port this analogy to a slightly different domain. And if you guys could leave the slides up on the screen, that'd be great. Thank you, because um, uh, I'm going to point at them, and I'm, I'm pointing at my face, which is almost as fun as pointing at actual words, but not the same. Uh, how tasty is our marketing? Right? How tasty is the way we sell stuff to our customers and our consumers at the end of the day? Because like, just like certain food is going to be tastier based on people's tongues and their stomachs, certain messages or ideas are going to be tastier based on the way they fit with people's minds. Right? If we understand the underlying science behind consumer behavior, behind word of mouth, behind social transmission, we can build campaigns, engineer content and stuff that will help uh, our brands catch on. And so I'm going to touch on three things today. I'll touch on how we can make our marketing tastier by understanding this underlying science, how we can use digital to drive performance. Digital is obviously an amazing uh, set of toolkits and channels. How can we use those more effectively? And how can we generate word of mouth uh, and use that to grow uh, our businesses at the end of the day? Before we get there, though, uh, one more question from me. Here are three products or brands that everyone in the room is probably quite familiar with. We have Walt Disney World, self-described place where dreams come true. We have Honey Nut Cheerios. A few of you may have had that today for breakfast, but the wonderful uh, and delicious breakfast cereal. And does everyone know Scrubbing Bubbles? Uh, for those who don't, you might not clean your own bathroom. Uh, it is a very effective uh, bathroom cleaner. If you had to guess, 
Which of these three products or brands do you think gets the most word of mouth? Is it Disney, is it Cheerios, or is it Scrubbing Bubbles? What do you think? Okay, let's take a quick vote. Uh, how many for Disney? Okay, it looks like most of the room. I heard someone saying Bubbles over here. How many for Bubbles? Okay, uh, maybe about 15% uh, for Bubbles. And Cheerios? Wow, uh, nobody. Okay, uh, I want to point out two things from this little exercise. Uh, first, this was certainly tougher uh, than the cheeseburger and the broccoli. Uh, I can't see everyone in the back because the lights are a little bright up here, but as I glanced at a few of your faces, uh, when I asked this question, some of you looked scared. Right? Like you had no idea how to begin to answer which one of these gets more word of mouth. And indeed, this is sort of a cheap parlor trick, right? Because one's going to win, two are going to lose, and most of you are sitting there going, well, what does this have to do with me? Right? Because I don't represent Disney World, and I don't represent Cheerios, and I don't represent Scrubbing Bubbles, so why do I care which one of these gets more word of mouth? And indeed, which one of these gets more word of mouth doesn't matter to you. Why one of them gets more word of mouth is really important, though. Because if we don't understand why consumers talk about and share some things rather than others, how do we hope to get them to share our stuff? Which brings me to the second point. If we had to guess, uh, I think Disney's the top vote getter by far. How many for Disney? OK, excellent, excellent guess. Uh, unfortunately, it's wrong, uh, but good guess. Uh, runner up with scrubbing bubbles. How many for bubbles? Also great guess, also wrong. The answer is Cheerios. The one that, unless I miss somebody, I think none of us guessed. Right? A room folks that are interested in digital marketing, none of us guessed, right? And I think this points out an important gap in our knowledge, right? We, if we don't understand why people talk and share, we're going to spend a lot of time and money and effort and energy in the wrong places. There's a lot of hype out there around social media, around viral marketing, around word of mouth, even around digital marketing. If we don't understand the science, the underlying customer at the end of the day, we're going to spend a lot of efforts and energy in the wrong places. We've got to understand why people talk and share and how to use that to get them to share our stuff. And so that's a long-winded introduction uh, to a title slide. As was nicely mentioned, I'm Professor Jonah Berger. I'm a marketing professor at the Wharton School, the University of Pennsylvania. What I'll do today uh, is give you a brief tour of my recent New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller, uh, Contagious, Why Things Catch On. Uh, importantly, everything I'm going to talk about today is based on rigorous academic research. We spent the last 15 years studying this space. Uh, I would love to be a social media guru. Uh, apparently, all you need to do to be a social media guru uh, is to have a theory. You don't need to actually collect any data to see if that theory is correct. You just get to assume uh, that your theory uh, is correct. Sounds like a great job. Uh, if you know anyone who's hiring, please let me know. Uh, I'm an academic. We tend to be a little bit more boring, but we also tend to be a little bit more right. Uh, and so what I'll try to do today uh, is be a little less boring, but equally right. Uh, I will share a lot of stories, uh, because we'll talk about stories of the currency of conversation. But underneath each of these stories is a lot uh, of research. We've looked at thousands of pieces of online content, tens of thousands of brands, uh, and millions of purchases. And so what I'll share with you today is based on all that research. Um, I think each of you have a copy of the book somewhere to take home with you. So thanks to Jonaya for uh, being nice to do that. So say, think of today as an appetizer for some of what's in there. Uh, all the references are in the back of the book if you want to dig into the research even more. Uh, and we may have time for questions today, but if we don't uh, and you want to reach out, uh, feel free to find me uh, at j1burger on, on Twitter. So uh, it goes without saying that word of mouth uh, is quite important. Uh, and indeed, if you don't believe me, uh, Wharton students sometimes believe their professors. But when major consulting firms say something, they all put their heads down and they decide now is the time to take notes. Uh, so none other than McKinsey pointed out that word of mouth generates more than twice the sales. Uh, of traditional advertising. Some research done by a couple colleagues of mine shows a dollar spent on, on word of mouth goes 10 times as far uh, as a dollar spent on traditional advertising. Any idea why word of mouth is so much more impactful or is so impactful? Somebody who said trust, give me a hand. What, what do you mean by trust? Yeah, what do you mean by trust? OK, but you don't trust companies? Not that personal connection. You know they're trying to sell you something, right? And by the way, we all recognize other companies. Customers, there's no way customers believe other companies' ads or messages. But our company's ads or messages, of course, right? The customer believes that. They put on a different hat uh, when, when our message comes on. My, my favorite example of this, um, uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a, a, an ad during football season with Joe Montana in it. Do you remember Joe Montana? Famous 49er quarterback, Joe Montana. And he was in this ad for these Skechers shoes uh, called Shape Ups. Uh, and I don't know if you know what shape-ups are, but in case you don't, uh, they're these shoes you're supposed to be able to wear that will give you a toned rear end. Uh, and, and so I want you to imagine you see Joe Montana wearing these shoes saying, I love these shoes. What would you think? And I remember thinking, oh, wow, uh, things must be really bad uh, in the Joe Montana household. 
right? He's got to owe somebody a lot of money because there's no way he actually uses these shoes. And this is the challenge. We all say we're great, right? Every shampoo ad you've ever seen shows people with long, flowy hair getting an attractive spouse, right? No shampoo ad shows someone using the shampoo and getting an ugly spouse. Right? No insurance message says, yeah, when you call us, we'll be difficult to get a hold of, and we won't actually process your claim quickly, and we'll reject it, and we'll make you wait for six months and deal with us. No, it all says it's easy, it's fast, it's painless. But because of that, the customer doesn't know whether to believe us or not. But their friends or colleagues are much more likely to trust that person, because that person's not self-interested. Right? So that first benefit is trust. The second benefit is a little more nuanced, and that's the targeting benefit uh, of word of mouth. How do we find new potential customers or, or clients? Right? And it's tough. That's exactly why we're here today. Think about lead generation, how we find the right people. Right? Uh, but word of mouth is also a great way to find the right people. Right? Because imagine uh, what happened to me a couple years ago happened to you. I got a free book in the mail. Uh, and publishers often send academics books with the hopes that we'll assign them to our students and they'll sell more copies uh, in the process. But this time they didn't just send me one book. They sent me two copies uh, of the same book. So I'm sitting there in my office going, OK, these look like the same book. Uh, why the second copy? And there's a note in the back of one of them that said, hey, Professor Berger, we think you'll like this book, but we think you'll also know someone else who will like this book. Pass the second copy on to them. That's the first very simple hack I'm going to share today. How by turning customers into advocates can we get them to do the work for us? Right? Because I didn't give that book out randomly. I passed it on to the person in my social network that I thought would find it most interesting. No wonder that referred business, people that come in from existing customers, have 20% higher customer lifetime value. Because someone went through their social network, almost like a searchlight, to find the person or people that'll find it most relevant. If you don't have a baby, no one's going to tell you about a great website for baby clothes. If you don't like spicy food, no one's going to tell you about a restaurant with really spicy curries. People share things with others, both who might be interested in it and when those people might be interested in it. And so word of mouth is quite, quite targeted, very efficient in finding interested uh, folks that might want to work with you. Right? And so the question today is, how can we turn our customers into the largest and most effective sales force we've ever had? Right? We all have a sales team. How can we turn our customers into a more trusted uh, and larger team? Uh, Uber did a great job of this a couple holiday seasons ago. They said, hey, uh, having a holiday party? Request free rides for your guests here. Now notice that. It's really nice of Uber to do that. But notice what they did. They said, hey, existing user, who in your social network hasn't used us already? Because we can't pass the coupon on to them, but might be interested in what we have to offer. Pass this along. They got their customers to do the work for them. Right? Uh, and so word of mouth is a great way to be more trusted and, and more targeted. And so the only question is how to get it, how to get people to talk uh, and share. And usually when we think about it, we think about social media. We think about Facebook, we think about Twitter, we think about LinkedIn, we think about blogs, we think about online reviews. Right? Uh, if you had to guess from 100% all the way down to zero, what percent uh, of all word of mouth is online? From 100% all the way down to zero. If you had to guess a number, all word of mouth uh, is, is online versus, let's say, offline. What percent would you guess is online? Uh, number of, of things people hear about brands. If you had to write down a list of where you heard about a brand during a day, where you heard about it from, uh, what percent of that would be online? OK, got a whole range of numbers here. I heard 80. I heard 10 or 5. Anyone want to go higher than 80? Lower than 5? OK, uh, whoever said 5 somewhere over here, if this was the price is right, uh, you would have won the toaster. Uh, the answer is around 7 uh, to 10 percent. About 7 to 10 percent uh, of all word of mouth is online. And it's important to put that number in context. Does that mean that online isn't important? No. Online is a great way. It's faster uh, and easier to reach a large set of people quickly. Uh, but I work with a lot of organizations that say, wow, only 10 percent is online. Why are we investing so much money in social media? And I usually say, well, that's a great question. Why are you investing so much money in social media? Because social media is only one channel through which word of mouth flows. Right? Lots of word of mouth is also offline. And more important than online versus offline is rather than the technology, understanding the psychology. Because if, if we don't understand why people talk and share, they're not going to share our stuff. We can have lots of friends and connections and ties online, but if no one passes our message on, it isn't going to matter. I think this cartoon uh, illustrates it really nicely. It's at a morose, uh, it's a funeral, uh, and she said, he had over 2,000 Facebook friends. I was expecting uh, a bigger turnout. Lots of organizations just thought if we accumulated social connections, we'd be successful. Whether online or off, if people don't share our stuff, it doesn't matter. Right? If we have 50 engaged people rather than 50 million non-engaged ones, those are going to be much more valuable. And so the question is, how do we get people to talk about and share our messages? Well, good news. It's not random, it's not luck, and it's not chance. There's a science behind why people talk and share. 
We've looked at thousands of pieces of online content, did a big analysis of six months uh, of New York Times articles, everything written by the newspaper, doing textual analysis to find out which articles made the most emailed list and why. We've done something similar with tens of thousands of YouTube videos. Uh, we've looked at tens of thousands of brands, both online and off, measuring the word of mouth that they get, and we've looked at thousands uh, and millions of purchases, both in the US and abroad. Again and again, we see the same six factors come up. Uh, in Contagious, I put those six factors uh, in a framework uh, called STEPS that stands for social currency, triggers, emotion, public, practical value, and stories. This isn't about one vertical versus another. This is about the psychology of why people talk and share. Right? This explains why people talk about brands and products and services, uh, but also why they talk about what they're doing this, this upcoming weekend. And I won't have time today to talk uh, about all six. I want to make sure to go in depth into a couple rather than just skirting over the top of a bunch. Uh, but I'll mention social currency uh, at least. Uh, I'll talk about triggers because I think that's really important uh, for some of the businesses you guys represent. Uh, and if there's time, I'll, I'll wrap up with stories uh, at the end. And for each of these, I'll talk a little bit about the science, uh, some case studies of how we can apply uh, that science uh, as well. So uh, is anybody from New York City uh, today, visiting from New York City? OK, a couple people. So for the rest of you, imagine it's the weekend, uh, and you go to New York City for a visit. Uh, you're walking around on the Lower East Side. Uh, your stomach is rumbling. you got to get a bite to eat. When you notice a big hot dog-shaped sign uh, out in front of a restaurant with the words, eat me, written on it in what look like mustard. You say, I haven't had a hot dog in a while. Check this place out. Uh, so you walk down a flight of stairs, uh, just like these, uh, into a restaurant called Criff Dogs. Now, if you like hot dogs, uh, you will be in heaven. Criff Dogs has every hot dog you can imagine. Uh, they have a good morning hot dog with bacon, eggs, and cheese. I don't know if you want to eat a hot dog for breakfast, but interesting nonetheless. Uh, they have a hot dog, three onion and pineapple, and they have a traditional New York style water dog with just whatever, ketchup and mustard. But you finish your hot dog, you notice something unusual uh, in the corner of the screen, corner of the room. Uh, it almost looks like a phone booth, like one of those things that Clark Kent might jump into to change uh, into Superman. Well, just for fun, you got a couple minutes, slide open that door, and walk inside. It's pretty cramped in there. It's a phone booth after all, not a lot of space. But on the wall, you'll see something you probably haven't seen in, I don't know, 15, 20, maybe even 25 years. Do you remember rotor dial phones? Remember those phones you had to stick your finger and you had to go around in a circle? Just for fun, stick your finger in the number three, go around in a circle, and hold the receiver up to your ear. Well, the phone will actually ring. It'll go ring, ring. Then someone will pick up the leather line, and they'll ask you whether you have a reservation. Now, the first time I heard this story, I said, a reservation? I'm in a phone booth inside of a hot dog restaurant, right? What could I possibly have a reservation for? Uh, but if you're lucky, and they happen to have space, or a friend of yours happen to make a reservation, the back of that phone booth will open, and you'll be led into a secret bar called Please Don't Tell. Now, please don't tell is vital the number of traditional laws of marketing, traditional laws of communication, right? No sign inside the restaurant. Uh, no sign outside on the street. They've done everything they can to make themselves difficult to find. And yet, every day they're full. 3 p.m., phone lines open up. By 3.30, all the seats are gone. You have to redial again and again and again trying to get through. I got it on like a Tuesday night uh, at like 7.30, not the most popular time. Uh, and it's not lack of competition, by the way. Just like you, lots of competition for attention. There's more than one uh, bar uh, in New York City. Turns out there's a bunch of bars on that side of the street, a bunch of bars on the other side of the street, lots of competition for attention. So what'd they do right? How'd they cut through the clutter? Well, they did something interesting. They made themselves a secret. And let me tell you a little secret uh, about secrets. Think about the last time someone told you something, and they told you not to tell anybody else. What's the first thing you then did with that information? <laughs> Probably told somebody, right? Because having access to information that not everyone else does makes you look in the know, makes you look smart. It gives you what I'll call social currency. Guys, can you leave my text on the slides? Thanks. Uh, it gives you what I'll call social currency. Just like the car we drive and just like the clothes we wear, the things we talk about and the things we share affect how other people see us. So one way to get people talking about our stuff, our brands, our products, our services, is to make them look good. Right? Too often we think, how good do we look? We measure things like NPS and other measures of customer satisfaction. We think if people like us, they'll talk about us. Right? But it's not just about whether they like us or not, it's how good they look when they talk about us. So let's spend a couple minutes uh, on this idea. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. Uh, her name is Carla, and this is a picture of her car. And I want to see how much you can guess about her based solely on this one piece of information. If you had to guess, for example, how old might you guess that Carla is? Her 37, 45, how many of you would say between 32 and say 48? OK, almost everybody. Does uh, she have kids? Yeah, they play sports. Yeah, what sport do they play? 
Yeah. Was there like a cheat sheet when you checked in, when you picked up your materials, you picked your t-shirt size, and they gave you a little slip of paper with the answers? No, right? We made these inferences because choices communicate information. Car we drive, also the clothes we wear. I thought a lot about what to wear to come see you guys today. Uh, sometimes I get up on a stage like this, and someone in the audience during the Q&A period, uh, usually uh, 65 plus, raises their hands and goes, oh, are you 24 uh, years old? No, it turns out I'm not, so I wear a jacket to encourage you to think I'm at least 28 or 30 and have my own credit card and can buy my own clothes. Uh, because if I came in here today uh, wearing shorts and a t-shirt, as I'd much prefer to be wearing on this muggy uh, Philadelphia morning, you probably wouldn't take me seriously. Right? What we drive, what we wear, is a signal of who we are. Well, guess what? Same thing with what we talk about and share. People talk about food, uh, restaurants, others assume they're a foodie. They talk about technology or finance, people assume they know a lot about that. What we share is a signal uh, of who we are. Right? If you look online, most posts are positive. Look at me, I got a new car. Look at me, I met a celebrity. Look at me, I'm on vacation. Nobody posts like, hey, look at me, I'm at the office, working on an Excel spreadsheet, uh, check out column C. Right? <laughs> Nobody posts that. Or maybe you have a colleague that posts that. You probably unfriended them at that point. Right? Because it wouldn't make us look very good. Right? What we share is a signal of identity. People share things to show desired things about themselves. Well, that's true. Great. How can we apply that idea? Right? Well, how can we make people feel like insiders? How can we make them feel smart, special, and in the know, like they're not like everybody else? Right? Please don't tell did a great job of that. A bar hidden inside a hot dog restaurant. I see many of you taking notes in general, but a few of you probably put your head down and you took notes there because you know it'll make you cool to know about that bar. Right? If you're looking for one in Philadelphia, by the way, Franklin Mortgage and Investment Company uh, and Hopsing Laundromat are two of my favorites. So I'd suggest checking them out this evening if you have time. Right? But someone makes us feel like an insider, they make us feel special, they feel in the know, we're more likely to talk about it uh, and share it. I did a project with LinkedIn a few years ago. They wanted to move from being a transactional site where people went when they were looking for job, uh, jobs to one of our daily use site. And so one thing we did with this campaign where they sent out emails to some of their users saying, you have one of the most influential profiles on LinkedIn. Top 1%, top 5% of all the profiles. Now people who got this email felt really good, but they didn't just feel good. Hundreds of thousands of people shared this with others. Why? Because status is only good if other people know that you have it. Right? Uh, people talk so much about their frequent flyer status. I'm gold this or platinum that or you know, the, the airport lounge in Rome Fiumicino isn't what it used to be. They no longer have the hummus that I love. Right? What they're really saying is look at me, I'm busy, I'm important, I travel a lot. But no one can say that because no one would want to be friends with that person. They need psychological cover to do that. They need to talk about their frequent flyer status or something else. But notice what gets to come along for the ride. You're bragging about how you're an influencer on LinkedIn, you're talking about LinkedIn. You're bragging about your frequent flyer status, you have to me mention which airline gave you that status. Right? Make people feel smart, special, in the know, they'll bring your brand uh, along for the ride. Beyonce did a great job of this a few years ago. Came out with a new album, no advertising. Just put it online because she knew people would want to be the first person in their social network to tell everybody else. Right? Uh, you look online, many people on, on YouTube, the first person to comment just writes, first. Right? They're like, dibs, I got there before everybody else. People love feeling special. How can we make people feel special uh, and different? If you look at how companies manage their email lists, right, when they make those people get it, feel like they're different in the know from everybody else, they're much more likely to share it. Zappos does a great job of this. Right? You order something from Zappos, they say two-day shipping. Then sometimes later that day, they'll send you a note, say, you special winner, you. You're such a great customer of Zappos. We're sending it to you today. You'll get it tomorrow. Now, I'm probably not the only person that got that email. I think thousands, if not millions, of other people get that email. But Zappos make those people feel really special. Make them feel special, feel different, they're much more likely uh, to share. So that's one way to get social currency. I'll talk about two here, and there are four in the book, but I'll mention just two here. Another is to find what I'll call the inner remarkability. And I think this idea is really key, right? Remarkability means something that's worthy of remark, something that is surprising, something that is novel, something that is interesting. And you might be saying, OK, this is great, this is really fun, but there's no way I could apply these ideas, right? I mean, great, if I was a hidden bar, this would be easy, right? But how can I do this for insurance? Uh, or how can I do this for other things that seem difficult to get people to talk about uh, and share? So what's a, a product or service? It doesn't have to be yours, but that you think would be difficult to get people to talk about uh, and share. Funeral homes, that's a nice one. Uh, what else? Scrubbing bubbles. 
We'll get to Cheerios in a second if you can, uh, if you can keep your curiosity. You could say socks, you could say dishwashers, you could say toilet paper, you could say blenders. Uh, let me show you an oldie but goodie of how a company got over 200 million views for videos about one of the least exciting things we can think of, uh, and that is uh, a blender. So here we go. Will it blend? That is the question. How many of you have seen one of these, by the way? OK, a couple of you. The rest of you are in, in for a treat. I love my new iPhone. It does everything. But will it blend? That is the question. Let's find out. I think I'm going to push the smoothie button. I smoke. Don't breathe this. Now you fans on YouTube have asked me to blend an iPhone. So I did it. But I have another. <laughs> I'm going to put this on eBay. That's pretty remarkable, right? I saw a couple of you with like, your mouth agape for the entire time it was running. Uh, this video has over, I think, 15 million views now. The set has over 200 million. They do it for like the Apple Watch and all sorts of different things. Blender sales go up over 700% when these videos come out. Now, any of us would be happy with a 700% sales increase in almost uh, anything. Uh, that's not the most remarkable thing about this to me. Uh, they did this for a $50 marketing budget. You laughed at that guy. Uh, he's not an actor. He's the CEO of the company. Uh, so they had hired a new marketing person. He came into the office, saw a pile of sawdust on the floor. He said, hey, what's going on with the sawdust? Are we expanding the company? His colleague says, no. Uh, the CEO is doing what he tries to do every day, which is break blenders. He would stick golf balls and big lighters and two by four pieces of wood in the blender, see if the blender was tough enough to cut it. Great story. I interviewed them for the book. Uh, they said, this is amazing. Filmed the CEO doing what he was already doing. I've got that goofy white lab coat, put it online. Right? The rest is history. That's not the most remarkable thing uh, about this to me. The most remarkable thing about this to me is that they did this for one of the least exciting things we can think of. If any of you are sitting there going, this is really fun, but there's no way we could do this, right, for funeral homes or life insurance or other types of insurance or anything we can think of, right, I want you to remember the blender. It's like a rallying cry. It's like, remember the Alamo, except the swept a blender for the Alamo, right? Nothing is less exciting than a blender. Whatever you are working on, I guarantee, is not less exciting than a blender, right? Uh, and it's not that certain things are naturally remarkable and others are doomed to fail. We can get people to talk about and share anything if we find that inner remarkability, if we show them rather than tell them, right? Too often we think if we just tell people, they'll take action. If we tell them why we're so great, they'll take action. We need to show them. They didn't tell people they make a really powerful blender. They showed people how powerful the blender was. And I'll get back to this at the end uh, when we talk uh, about stories, right? Showing rather than, than telling. Uh, next, I want to talk about triggers. We talked about social currency. Uh, of the six, I think triggers is very intuitive once you hear it, uh, but I guarantee none of you are, are using it uh, already. Uh, and to talk about triggers, I want to use an example uh, from G G Geico's campaign uh, for Hump Day. How many of you have seen uh, Geico's campaign for Hump Day? OK, at least a few of you. Uh, for those who haven't, you're probably aware that Wednesday in the United States is called Hump Day. Uh, why? Because it's the hump you have to get over to get to Friday. So the insurance company Geico builds a piece of content based on this. There's an annoying camel walking around an office going, what day is it today? What day is it? What day is it? Everybody ignores him. He's a very annoying camel. Uh, finally, he comes across this poor woman, and she goes, it's Hump Day. And the camel goes, woo woo. Uh, and the ad goes, how happy are people who save money with Geico happier than a camel on Hump Day? Get it? Camels, humps, hump day? You're supposed to chuckle when I make a joke. Come on. I did like the whole woo woo thing. Should I have done like the mic, 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 mic part, maybe? OK, the mic, 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 mic part is funnier. OK, I shall, I'll do that next time. Uh, this is funny when you see it on television. It is. It's not that funny, though. Yet this is the second most shared ad of a couple years ago. Not a beer ad, not a car ad, but an insurance ad. 
If you're sitting there going, there's no way we could apply this stuff, they did this for insurance. This is the second most shared ad. The runner up to the Dove campaign, where they sketch the women's faces and all the women cry at the end, right? That was the one that got a lot of attention that year. This is the runner up to that. Why did so many people share this piece of content? Well, I'm a data guy, I dug a little deeper. This is what the share data looks like. There's a spike in shares, and then it goes down. And then another spike, and then it goes down. And then another spike, and then it goes down. Look closer, the spikes aren't random. They're seven days apart. And if you look even close, you'll notice that they're every Wednesday, or as it's colloquially known, hump day, right? This content is equally good or bad every day of the week. It's good or bad on Monday, it's good or bad on Tuesday, it's good or bad on Wednesday, but Wednesday rolls around, provides a ready reminder, what a psychologist would call a trigger, to make people think about it and talk about it and share it. Because if something's top of mind, it's much more likely to be tip of tongue. Again, too often we think, do people like us? And we assume that if people like us, they'll talk about us. But if people aren't thinking about us, they're not going to talk about us, right? There may be a restaurant or whatever city you live in that you love to go to, but if you're not thinking about it when you're about to go out to dinner, you'll never go there. 70% of purchase is consideration. Am I thinking about you near the time of action? Some, a study was done in the grocery store a few years ago where they changed the music that played over the PA system. Some days they played French music and some days they played German music. What'd they find? One days they played French music, sales of French wine went up. And on days they played German music, sales of German wine and beer went up. Did the music change what wine people liked? No, they still liked whatever wine they liked. All it did was remind them to take action. Top of mind, much more likely to be tip of tongue, much more likely to be purchased. So let's spend a couple minutes uh, on, on this idea. Here's a little more data. Uh, this is word of mouth about Cheerios by time of day. What do you notice about when people talk about Cheerios? Breakfast time. Notice how it's shifted to the right on the weekend? Any idea why? Sleep in, right? One reason why people talk about a product or service is they just used that product or service, right? I just called up my insurance company to make a claim, much more likely to be top of mind, much more likely to be talked about. But notice what happens the rest of the day. People don't keep talking about Cheerios because there's nothing to remind them of it uh, in the environment. This is the problem for Disney. Great engaging experience, but people don't go very often. And so there aren't very many triggers to remind people to think about it, right? So besides using our product or service, what other triggers can we create? Are there other triggers uh, as well? And good news, there are. So if I said, for example, peanut butter and, what word might come to mind? Jelly. Or if I said rum and, you might think of Coke. Notice that peanut butter is almost like a little advertisement for jelly. It's almost like jelly should pay peanut butter like a kickback <laughs> or like a referral fee, right? Every time peanut butter's around. Because if peanut butter's around, jelly doesn't have to remind you it exists. Right? Peanut butter does all the work for jelly. That's why Michelob, probably maybe uh, too young to remember this, but uh, Michelob has an old slogan, weekends are made for Michelob. Some of you might remember that slogan. They wanted people to think about the beer when the weekend rolled around. Corona's done the same thing with the beach. Right? I challenge you to go on a beach vacation and never think about Corona. Right? It's pretty much impossible. You're lying on the beach, you've got your sunscreen on, you're reading your book, you get thirsty, you think about Corona. Right? And what does it always have in it? A lime. Is that random? Is that luck? No, there's a science there, right? The beach is Corona's uh, trigger, or very simply, the beach is Corona's peanut butter. And so what I'd ask us to think about at this point is, okay, what's our peanut butter? What's the thing in the environment that's gonna remind people of you, right, uh, every time they see it? Because we can advertise and we can uh, email people and we can call people and try to remind them how great we are, or we can link them to a peanut butter, and every time they see that peanut butter, they'll think uh, of, our, of our jelly. Right? Kit Kat did a great job of this a few years ago. Sales were down, I think, by like 30, 35%. People still liked Kit Kat, but they weren't thinking about it. They weren't buying it. So they did this campaign where they linked Kit Kat to coffee. Kit Kat and coffee are Break's best friend. Having a coffee break, have a Kit Kat. Thinking about coffee, think about Kit Kat. Coffee and Kit Kat, Kit Kat and coffee, best friends forever. Right? If you're a Kit Kat, why is coffee a really good trigger or really good peanut butter to link yourself to? People drink it all day. Lots of people drink it. Lots of people drink it really frequently, right? Frequency is a great way to choose our triggers, right? Uh, think about weekends are made for Michelob. That was originally holidays are made for Michelob. But they moved it to the weekend because the weekend is more frequent. Think about Budweiser's campaign, the What's Up campaign a number of years ago, right? Many times people said that phrase, what's up to one another, and they always thought, uh, often thought about Budweiser uh, along the way. But it's not just frequency. My favorite example of this uh, is reusable grocery bags. How many of you have a reusable grocery bag somewhere in your house? Almost everybody, right? You have to be like a bad person not to have one reusable grocery bag somewhere in your house. Every conference you've gone to for the past 10 years has given you some sort of reusable grocery bag. But keep your hand up if you use them 
every time you go to the grocery store. Yeah, so like you six are clearly better than the rest of us. Uh, for the rest of us, why do we forget? Or alternatively, when do we remember our bags? At the store, at the checkout line, which last time I checked is kind of too late, <laughs> right? We've done all our shopping. We feel really good about ourselves. We get our cart to a short aisle. And we go, oh, I forgot my bags. You're not going to go back to home to get your bags to come back to the store. Right? It's like a customer remembering your ad, your message, your brand, right after they decided to work with a competitor instead. Right? It's not just about frequency. When people are triggered is really important. And so I would say there are four key things when we think about triggers, four key questions that we need to answer. First, who do we want to be triggered? Right? Who is that target segment, could be multiple segments, that we want to think about us? Then when do we want them to think about us? Right? If I'm reusable grocery bags, you have to think about me before you leave the house. That's the right when. Are there certain times of year when people tend to re-up their policies? Are there certain days of week when they tend to take action of certain types of things? When do we want them to think about us? Then what is in the environment at that time, and how can we create a link to that thing? Right? If I'm, uh, let's say, a radio station, and I want you to listen to me in the car on the way to work, well, when is on the car on the way to work? What is around that time? Maybe it's traffic, maybe it's a steering wheel, and how create a link to that thing through marketing communications uh, and other methods, right? The who, the when, the what, and the how will help us think about what's the right trigger, how to create that link, and how to be top of mind at the right time uh, for, for action. Okay, uh, I won't talk uh, about, oh, I'll give you one more example of this, uh, just a fun application. So we did this at Stanford. We wanted to get Stanford undergraduates to eat more fruits and vegetables, uh, and we gave them one of two slogans to try to motivate their behavior. Uh, live the healthy way, eat five fruits and veggies a day, and each and every dining hall tray needs five fruits and veggies a day. And we split uh, the group, we did an A-B test. Some people got one message, some people got the other, uh, and we gave it to them halfway between a two-week period, and we measured their consumption across that two-week period. Now, people got the live the healthy way slogan, thought it was really clever. They loved it, right? On a 10-point scale, they rated it like a 9. They said they would definitely change their behavior. We measured whether their behavior changed. Didn't change at all. People loved the slogan, no change in fruit and vegetable consumption. People got the second slogan, thought it was stupid. On a, a 1 to 10 scale, it was like a 2.1 or something like that, right? Not rated very, very highly. Yet people got the slogan, increased their fruit and vegetable consumption by 25%, right? Why do you think this slogan worked when the other one didn't? The tray, right? Think about it. You're a student, right? You're the who. When is right when I'm getting dinner? What is in the environment at that time? You picked up a tray to put food on your tray, right? We went through those four, four things, that who, the, the when, the what, and the how, to pick the right trigger in the environment at the right time to drive action. And this silly slogan created that link. Just like Geico has reminded people on Wednesday to think about hump day and to think about Geico uh, as well. Top of mind, more likely to be tip of tongue, more likely to drive uh, behavior. OK, I won't have time today to talk about emotion. I'll let you read about it in the book. Um, I'm also going to skip public. I'm also going to skip practical value. Uh, there's a nice example there. Um, uh, Dick Thaler just won the Nobel Prize for exactly this sort of stuff, but how we frame numbers, even whether the same actual number, framing them can make them seem larger or smaller and drive people to take action. So I'll, I'll let you read about this uh, in, in the practical value chapter. Let me wrap up by talking about stories. Uh, and to talk about stories, I want to talk about a particular type uh, of story. I want you to imagine that you're at a party and someone walks up to you and says, did you know that Maui Jim uh, has great customer service? The sunglass company, Maui Jim, has great customer service. What would you do if someone walked up to you at a party and said, did you know that Maui Jim has great customer service? Yeah, do you work for them? You'd probably say, oh, wow, that's super interesting. Hey, I actually, I left my drink, I think, actually in the other room. Would you hang out here for just a second? Right? And then that person would never see you again. Because no one wants to be friends with someone that sounds like a walking advertisement. Right? People need psychological cover to talk about products and services and brands. But stories do exactly that. I had a friend who had a pair of Maui Jim sunglasses. He loved them, right? Uh, but he had a dog who was teething. His dog got a hold of them, tore them to shreds. Pieces of sunglasses all over his apartment. So we got a box together, put the pieces in the box, couldn't even tell what SKU number it was. So he, he sent them back to Maui Jim with a note that said, hey guys, I love these sunglasses. I'm happy to pay for a new pair, but I don't know which ones they are. Just let me know and, I, and I'll pay for them. Well, a couple days later, he got a box in the mail. And in that box was a free pair of sunglasses and a dog bone. <laughs> and what I love about that story is that everything on the left side of the screen came along for the ride. Right? Good stories aren't just stories. They're vessels or carriers of information. They're what I'll call a Trojan horse story. Right? Think about the story of the Trojan horse, the Greeks, the Trojans. No one can win, so they build that wooden horse. They hide their men inside. Good stories are like that. Yes, there's an engaging exterior right, that makes it funny, that makes it worth telling, but along the way, a kernel, a brand, an attribute, gets to come along for the ride. 
right? If people remember our message, but they can't remember who it's for, it's not going to help us at the end of the day, right? I saw that really hilarious mayhem thing on television, but if I don't remember who it's for, it's not going to help my brand uh, at the end of the day, right? We have to come along for the ride. If you think about that blend tech, will it blend? If you had to fill in the blank, they make a very blank blender. How would you fill in that blank? Strong, powerful, tough, exactly the attribute that they want you to remember. They didn't just do something funny, they built a Trojan horse that carries their message along for the ride. Let me give you one more uh, example of this and then I'll wrap up. Uh, this example is panda cheese. Uh, you're probably wondering, cheese? Made from panda milk? That sounds very difficult, uh, if not impossible. Uh, I did, it's not cheese made from panda milk. It's an Egyptian company. Uh, their, their brand name is Panda, and they make cheese. And I want you to watch a couple uh, of their ads. Uh, and they're, they're funny, so you're allowed to laugh. Uh, so I'll, here we go. Please. I'm going to buy some good chicken. just you know why. Never say no to Panda. I'm going to show you a couple, a couple of these. Good morning. Good morning. I got you Panda cheese for breakfast. No thanks. I don't feel well. Never say no to Panda. Dad, why don't we get some Panda cheese? Enough. That's too much already. Never say no to Panda. <laughs> and, and last but not least, Dad, why don't we get some Panda? Just you know why. Get one. Get one more. All right, uh, so just to wrap up, uh, today we talked about at least a few uh, of the six steps to boosting word of mouth. We talked about social currency. How can we make people feel smart, special, in the know like they're not like everybody else, like please don't tell did. Uh, triggers, top of mind, tip of tongue. What's our peanut butter? What's the thing in the environment that will remind people of us, even if we're not around? Uh, motion is when we care, we share. Public, easier to see, easier to imitate. Practical value is all about useful information and content marketing. And last but not least is stories. When people put their kids to bed at night, nobody tells bedtime facts. Doesn't happen. They tell bedtime stories. Stories are the currency of communication. But certain stories are more effective than others. Right? As we talked about, we've got to build a Trojan horse story. I hope you uh, enjoyed Panda Cheese. I hope you found it funny. But that actually wasn't why I showed it to you. I showed it to you because I challenge you to tell someone who wasn't here today about Panda Cheese and not mention a certain word. And that word is Panda which is exactly the brand that they want you to remember. They didn't just build a story, they built a Trojan horse that carried their brand uh, along for the ride, right? How can we find that Trojan horse? It doesn't have to be funny. Humor might not be the right emotion for us. You can read about it in the emotions chapter. Lots of emotions drive sharing. Not all of them, but a number do, right? But we have to figure out what our kernel is uh, and use a story to carry it. And so in case it's helpful, two key next steps from this talk. I often come back from conferences like this and I have pages and pages of notes and I never know what to do next. So two key next steps from this particular presentation. First, what's that kernel? Right? Traditional blocking and tackling of marketing basics. What's that kernel that you want people to remember? If you had to script the conversation from an existing customer to a potential customer, what would they talk about and share? What message would come along or messages would come along for the ride? 
And then how can we apply the steps around it to make it more likely uh, to be shared? How can we find our social currency? How can we figure out our peanut butter? Uh, and in case it's helpful, uh, there's a resource, uh, an application guide uh, on my website, uh, just jonaberger.com slash resources. You can download it uh, and work on it with your teams. It'll walk you through step by step how to apply these, these ideas, how to find that peanut butter, how to build that Trojan horse story, uh, and so on. Because again, word of mouth is really powerful, but it's not random, and it's not luck, and it's not chance. There's a science behind why people talk uh, and why people share. If we understand that science, we can craft contagious content, we can get more word of mouth, and we can help our products and our services catch on. Uh, thank you guys very much. Do we have time for questions or no? Yes, no? Yeah. Do we have, uh, so maybe we, I, I'm looking at the boss. It looks like we have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, so maybe one or two questions. I don't want to keep things running on time, but uh, happy to take one or two questions if there are questions. The beauty of something this intimate is this is a great chance to ask questions. So please, don't be afraid. Right? This, I, I know you made it. We could be wrong, but it's a great chance. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Uh, so uh, Fast Company did a piece on me in the book uh, when, when it first came out. Uh, and uh, uh, you never realize how ugly your teeth are until someone takes a two-page spread of your mouth because uh, it's about word of mouth, so there was a two-page spread of my fine-looking but not perfect-looking teeth. I'm like, I should get my teeth whitened and straightened and capped and all those things. Uh, but they ended the interview by saying, uh, look, you know, if the book doesn't make the New York Times bestseller list, the principles don't work. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, how to apply the principles. So uh, we didn't talk about public today, but the idea is if it's easier to see, it's easier to imitate. People tend to look to others to see what others are doing. So we made the cover orange, so when someone's reading it on the plane or the train, someone's more likely to see it, more likely to ask uh, what book it is. Uh, in terms of triggers, uh, the book came out around cold and flu season. Uh, a couple years ago, lots of people sneezing. Uh, so we created some orange tissues that said, don't you wish your ideas were this contagious? To make uh, when you're sneezing uh, about diseases a trigger for reminding you when you're sneezing about uh, word of mouth to share those things as well. So we've thought a lot about building these principles in. We gave away two uh, with the book, which I think is just great, right? If you sell a physical thing, or you can give people a sample, nothing is better than social trial. Right? Uh, much better than sort of pushing money in terms of advertising. Let people give it to their friend and have them try it. And obviously, there are challenges with doing that in some things like insurance, but other things it's possible. Social trial is just a great way uh, to give people a chance to experience the good uh, and see if, if they like it. So those are just a, a few of the ways we thought about uh, applying, applying these ideas. Uh, maybe one, uh, one more? Yeah. Yes. No, that includes all online content. Uh, that includes social media and videos and images and, and text. And, and again, what I'm not saying is that social media is not a valuable channel. It's just way too many companies say, oh yeah, we're doing word of mouth because we're doing social media. Yes, yeah, and, and when I work with clients, I encourage them a lot, social media is fine, but let's think about an offline strategy too. Right? So uh, I'm working on a hardware project right now, for example, with Facebook. And we're doing some online stuff. Obviously, they're Facebook. They have great data. They can utilize that data. But also, OK, well, how can we use offline uh, word of mouth? Or doing another project with Google where we're thinking about, you know, how can we motivate people in these communities to, to take action and, and talk and share? And I think too often we think about the technology. We assume if we're on social media, we're creating content. Right? It's really hard for our follower count to go down. You have to work really hard to have that follower count go down. That doesn't mean that anyone's engaging with your content. right? And so so this is a metrics audience. You guys are clearly moving past friends and followers to better metrics. But we've got to think about offline as well as online if we're hoping to, to move the needle uh, as well. Yeah, so a uh, couple things. First of all, offline is much harder uh, to measure, right? And what's nice uh, is we've worked with a company called Keller Fay, uh, which has uh, it's basically the Nielsen of word of mouth. They do diary studies where they ask people, what did you talk about uh, and share? What brands did you hear about in the past 24 hours? So we've analyzed all their data, uh, and the steps are based on some of the findings we have from that. Uh, and so when, when I work with clients, we apply the learnings from that data set uh, to, to get more word of mouth. Um, I, you can measure offline if you want. Uh, you can also rely on us and others that have done the crunching of the numbers to know what works. Um, but you need to hire a company like them that does diary studies. Uh, there are other studies where they actually use ambient sound to collect sort of uh, conversations and measure things that way as well. It's much harder to, to measure than, than online. 
I would recommend understanding why people share and building content that hits those dimensions rather than, because right, we measure offline word of mouth, but we don't know why we're getting it or not. It's not going to matter, right? We don't care how much we're getting. We care how to get more of it. Um, and so that's why I think the steps are so useful, because they'll say, well, you apply this particular principle, and you're more likely, 20% more likely to get people uh, to talk uh, and share. And so some of them, by the way, apply more offline than online. So triggers is really important offline, for example, right? Uh, you sit, if you have a conversation with someone offline, and someone asks you a question, and you sit there going, waiting to think about the most interesting thing, it gets awkward really quickly. So you have an incentive to fill in that conversational space. What do you talk about? Whatever's top of mind. Whereas online, we construct and refine those identities a lot more. We take time to write the message that looks exactly right. Uh, and so social currency matters relatively more on online. And so depending on which channel we're trying to use, one is more important than the other. But I would say more, let's think about the content we're creating, the campaigns we're designing, and measure how likely they are to be to talk about and shared using the steps, rather than necessarily measure the word of mouth uh, on the back end. Yeah. I'll take one more, yeah. Yeah, so what's nice for the Blender company is they're basically doing no advertising, right? So it's challenging for a room full of you guys. You're saying, okay, well, I've got word of mouth, but I've also got 17,000 other things that I'm doing. How do I, how do I measure impact? And so um, I think you know, the best traditional sort of ways are a marketing mix model, which many of you may do, where you sort of have sales over time and you have the impact through various channels uh, that you try to measure. Um, sometimes we can do something where we get a click-through rate of a particular piece of content. Uh, that's why we like online. Uh, online, it seems like it's more measurable. Uh, the challenge is we end up attributing way too much to the last click. Right? Many of you are probably familiar with last click attribution and the challenges. Uh, we think you know, SEO works much better sometimes, uh, or sort of uh, search ads work much better sometimes than it actually does, because that's the last click, uh, not about all the brand building that happened at, at the beginning. And so we need to be certainly careful about attribution and build models that think both about the brand building that happens early on, uh, as well as the thing that gives us the final click. And both are obviously important. That final click is really important, but so is all the work we did to get people to that click uh, at the end as well. Okay, uh, thank you guys very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Appreciate it.